A common shape that's often proximal to Antiquatech is the octagon. It's consistently paired with domes, spires, and cathedrals, and some researchers have suggested that such eight-sided footprints might once have housed a reactor or power generator. In Copenhagen, a city in which I found several examples of potential Antiquatech, I became interested in the octagonal structure of the Caritas well, installed at Gameltorv under Christian IV in 1608. A century later, a curious tradition developed that every year on the king's birthday, copper balls were placed in the water. These balls are covered in 24 karat gold and they balance, more or less, on the fountain's vertical spouts. Looking at the fountain's position on the plaza, we can see that it aligns exactly with two other features close by, the dome on a building kitty corner to the fountain, and the bell tower at Vorfru, or the Church of Our Lady. Today, Vorfru is glaringly Greco-Roman, but it was originally built in 1314 as a Gothic structure. That was destroyed in 1807, and it was redesigned in the neoclassical or Roman style. It has no dome, but its tower houses 42 bells. The shapes on this three-part alignment are the circle dome, the octagonal fountain, and the square bell tower. And as we'll soon see, this combination of shapes has a frequency built in. Here's another perspective showing the Caritas Well Fountain proximity to the two domes the one sitting kitty-corner from the alignment, and another one adjacent to the fountain, but that doesn't feature on any other alignment. This photograph from Google Earth shows these domes from above, and we can see that work was being done on the adjacent dome. You can just make out what looks like a copper core. But there's something odd about all this. It turns out the kitty-corner dome is modern. This photograph of the Gameltorf Plaza shows that the Kitty Corner Dome didn't exist as late as 1860. This means that the alignment between the Dome, the Caritas Well, and Vorfru isn't an ancient feature at all. It may well be modern technology that's currently in use today. Another octagonal structure present in Gameltorv is this tiny domed gazebo. In Copenhagen, gazebos like this generally function as kiosks from which to buy a coffee. But gazebos in the U.S. are usually larger, found in parks and used as bandstands, an area for the performance of music and the generation of frequency. Gazebos can be round, square, or hexagonal, but when I think of a gazebo, I think of an octagonal shape. The word gazebo derives from the English word gaze and the suffix of ebo, which is a Latin suffix denoting a verb's future tense. This might suggest that a gazebo could be used for gazing into the future, something seers, alchemists, and fortune tellers do using a crystal ball. This Crazy Cat cartoon from 1932 was called the Crystal Gazebo, and it featured a jackal in a Tartarian structure consulting a crystal ball. Likely, the word gazebo evolved to describe the place where gypsies performed crystal gazing in a curtained tent. The one shown here is round, but a domed octagonal gazebo could be killing two birds with one stone, the dome and octagon together, without all the trouble of a cathedral. So is this gazebo a mini power plant? Probably not, though it does seem to be covering something. 
It stands on the spot where this cylinder stood in the 1860 photograph. But there is a potential reason that these older, larger, and now empty octagons are theorized to have been technological features. It's because reactors are often housed in octagons, even today, to mitigate voltage harmonics. In 1953, the Raleigh Research Reactor Building housed its octagonal reactor room inside an octagonal pit under a domed roof. A recent study from 2005 states that the beneficial effects of a stator of octagonal shape are briefly investigated. The main emphases in the present study have been to decrease power fluctuations and suppress voltage harmonics. In an electrical system, voltage harmonics work in the same way that musical harmonics do. The harmonics are multiples of the tonic. Voltage harmonics are caused by current harmonics, and the fundamental frequency of the electrical current is usually 60 Hz in the US. We might call that the tonic. The second harmonic would be the next multiple of 120 Hz, the next octave up from the fundamental frequency of 60. And the third current harmonic at 180 Hz would be considered a perfect fifth interval up from the current second harmonic, just like it is in music. So, for any electrical circuit in the US, the perfect fifth off its tonic of 60 Hz is 180 Hz. So, what does the shape of a room have to do with voltage harmonics? As we see in so much ancient architecture, frequency can be built into a structure. In the case of an electrical current harmonic of 180 Hz, its shape would be a triangle with a total of 180 degrees. And an octagonal room with a total of 1080 degrees would be a perfect fifth, two octaves above that triangle. According to Irina Ivanova and the other researchers into electricity at Uppsala University in Sweden, this octagonal shape would be used to suppress the voltage harmonics of the generator housed inside it. The idea that frequency is built into a structure allows us to calculate other relationships between polygons in terms of musical intervals. For example, from the triangle at 180 degrees to the square, we have an octave, or doubling. From the square to the pentagon is a perfect fifth. And a hexagon is another octave above the triangle and square. A seven-sided heptagon is a major third above the hexagon. The octagon is a perfect fifth above the hexagon. And the nine-sided aneagon is a minor seventh above the hexagon. And this order is exactly how the harmonic series is built. In my book, The Next Octave, this order of tone generation is laid out on page 262. The tonic at harmonic 1, the perfect fifth at harmonic 3, the major third at harmonic 5, and the minor seventh at harmonic 7. Don't let the numbers of the scale positions be confusing. The important thing is that the harmonic series brings new tones in as odd numbers. And the first four tones are harmonics 1, 3, 5, and 7, which become the structural beams of the chromatic scale that comes later between harmonics 16 and 32. The three beams within the boundary of the octave are shaded here in various shades of light gray to show their structural presence. Like the square, a circle also contains 360 degrees, and we can calculate the relationship between the circle and octagon as the same as the tonic and perfect fifth. 
The interval between the circle and the octagon is one of octave growth and Mies regulation, and this is why both shapes are used in the mitigation of electrical harmonics. The connection between the octagon and the circle reminds me of a footbag Al sewed many years ago. There aren't many ways to build a sphere using an octagon, but he found a way, sewing a footbag using six of them. How are you doing? <laughs> doing I am going to have him on a couple of these because he's the geometry guy. He's taught oh, me cool. everything I know about sacred geometry. Love okay. that topic. The soft sphere contains 26 panels in all. The octagons are larger, surrounded by a border of 12 squares and 8 hexagons. So the frequency built into this footbag is that of square, hexagon, octagon, or tonic, octave, and perfect fifth. We can hear the prominence of the perfect fifth in the power chord, but here we can see these intervallic relationships in this particular design of a sphere. In this design, a different frequency is built into the structure of the bag. A sphere composed completely of triangles is a unison of the tonic or fundamental frequency. In this one, composed of pentagons and hexagons, the embedded frequency involves the interval between the perfect fifth and the next octave. This bag was designed and sewn by Al's friend Dean Anderson. It's made up of parallelograms and pentagons, the tonic and perfect fifth. And this one, that Alan calls the lotus, is again a tonic, octave, and perfect fifth. In all these footbag designs, only the first three harmonics of tonic, octave, and perfect fifth are used. Because none of them uses a heptagon or a neogon in the design, we're not seeing the fifth or seventh harmonics present but Alan doesn't think that's outside the realm of possibility. Can you build a sphere using a shape that has seven or nine sides to it? Like an octagon would have eight. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, it's very likely uh, that you can, however, because you can actually build out of as many different shapes and forms uh, into a sphere yeah. as you would like. Yeah. And there's no limit to it. Uh, however, if you want a symmetrical, that's a whole different deal then. And I would say the nine, number nine, has a much better chance than the seven. Uh, it's just, uh, the, if you don't have anything that goes in seven, you've got three that goes in nine. Right. And therefore, you would have a much better chance to uh, have a design that would have a nine-sided uh, panel in there. Like a three-six-nine So thing? that should be probably two, maybe three nine-sided, plus uh -huh. some surrounding. Right. Yeah. But again, this all points back to the function of the Mies. We might expect that when we create an octagon from a square, moving from four sides to eight, or from four vertices to eight, we might think that we're engaged in the process of doubling. But this is not multiplication of a frequency. This is division at the Mies, which is how the perfect fifth functions in the harmonic series. So we don't end up with an angle value of the octagon that's double that of the square. We end up with an angle value vibrating at the ratio of 3 to 2, or a perfect fifth. Here, the octagon as Mies sits in the power of three position on the Mobius circuit, governing the first and second harmonics, which is likely how it mitigates voltage harmonics by preventing the doubling power of two from its natural tendency toward infinite expansion. I'm grateful for any feedback. Please leave your thoughts in the comments, and thank you for watching.